Again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panelists. Um, my name's Nick, Nick York. I am a patient advocacy healthcare liaison officer for Leukemia Care. Um, and I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, so perhaps we could start with yourself, Emma, if you could share who you are and, and your connection to clinical trials. Yeah, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. So I'm Emma Williams and I'm um, a manager in Cardiff and um, I've worked on haematology trials since 2009 um, and I manage the current haematology portfolio um, within Cardiff but we cover, well we really cover the rest of Wales um, and such a large uh, teaching hospital, we're a tertiary referral centre so we have a number of um, many more trials at, at our centre. So, yeah hoping to really look into looking forward to the discussion today thank you emma i would have also passed on to our uh, hematologist panelist hopefully he'll be able to join us and we seem to be lost in traffic um so in the meantime how about over to our patient advocates um jackie would you like to introduce yourself Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm Jackie. Um, I'm a patient. I also worked in the NHS for many, many years, 40 years before uh, in the role of the haematology services manager. Uh, that included responsibility for the management of a portfolio of clinical trials for haematology patients, um, all parts of the, of the process. Uh, as I said, I'm also a CLL patient of nine years. Uh, currently on my fourth line of treatment and uh, I've also participated in two clinical trials, um, FLARE and then also a first in human study of a bispecific bi T-cell engaging antibody recently. Thank you Jackie. Um, well uh, you've got some extensive uh, experience before um, being diagnosed as a patient and getting involved in trials as a patient. So this, you've got a lot of information and interesting stuff that hopefully we, you'll be able to share. Thanks for joining us. And Sophie, sorry, last but not least. It's all right, Nick. Hi, I'm Sophie and I am the Patient Advocacy Officer at Leukemia Care. Um, but as well as my role as Advocacy Officer, I'm also a patient myself. Um, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia way back four years ago now. Um, and I, when I was diagnosed, I was put on the UCAL 2011 trial. Um, and even though I wasn't on it for very long, I've, I've got experience being on there. And, and yeah, so really looking forward to this discussion. Today. Should be good. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I, I apologise to everybody that's in the audience at the moment. I have a feeling that um, I've just seen um, somebody join a Teams link instead of this link. I don't know if one of my colleagues are listening, if they're able to have a look in Teams to see if they can hopefully redirect our um, haematologist, Francesco, to us. I have a feeling he may be in Teams as, as it's 3.30, he may have joined there. If not, we will proceed without Francesco. I think the idea of today is obviously if we can try and address many, the many, many questions that um, patients and haematologists or the care team may have um, when discussing clinical trials or when considering clinical trials. So I'm just thinking it would it'd be quite handy to have a maybe approach with a little bit of myth busting um, and looking at some of the questions or some of the per perceptions that many of us have had before the first time we ever considered clinical trial. So I was just wondering if we could sort of start off with a section, maybe looking at um, helping uh, with understanding of what clinical trials are. Um, so I'm going to pose a question that's often asked. Is it true that um, trials only consider new drugs that we don't know very much about yet? Um, and I, I thought perhaps it'd be a good idea to ask you, Emma, if you could um, address that question and maybe at the same time explain a little bit about the clinical trials process. Yeah, sure. So um, probably just to get through any misconceptions, there are a number of um, phases of clinical trials. Um, so not every trial that we work on is um, a first in human trial and is an experimental trial. A lot of the trials that we work on, especially within my unit as a later phase unit, um, are trials that have been tested through a number of different people. So they started mm -hmm. an early phase trial, 
um, with a small cohort of patients. Then that expands to um, slightly larger cohort and then they roll it out into a very very big cohort to test and what they do at that stage is to test if um, the standard of care treatment um, is if the the newer treatment is is better or it has, has got less side effects than the the other treatment so it's basically um, there are lots of different phases and not um, every every drug is experimental um, and you know we work across the board of all those trials um, so we would give advice on that trial according to the patient and, and the scenario at that time. Emma thank you so much for your explanation that's that's been really helpful and um, quite timely as well that Francesco <laughs> it's really 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 good to see you thank you we found you I think I lost you in in the ether somewhere earlier um, <laughs> So we, we made a little bit of a start. Um, perhaps you could introduce yourself to everybody in the audience. Um, that would be a terrific start. And then I'll throw a question at you. Yeah. Shall I start? Um, yeah, please, please, please introduce yourself to everybody. So my name is Francesco Forconi. I am a consultant hematologist and professor of hematology at the University of Southampton. My work is both clinical and lab research with a group of uh, at the moment to be 14 people to look after in the lab uh, and um, i'm very much focused in the clinic around chronic lymphocytic leukemia and uh, low-grade lymphomas uh, and i'm very much focused on in the lab and not in the clinic as well uh, around chronic lymphocytic leukemia and lymphoma Okay. Uh, Thank you for that, Francesca. So the, the principles, though, involved in clinical trial decisions between the, the um, healthcare team and the patient, the principles are effectively the same across the different leukemias. You know, in, um, so th I thank you for joining us and bringing your wealth of experience as a PI, as a principal investigator and a lead clinical researcher. Thank you. I wasn't able to catch up with you and explain it. I think what we want to try and do is a little bit of myth busting and, and uh, at the same time, uh, a little bit of understanding about what clinical trials are. So um, uh, we, we didn't ask you to give us a talk in explanation at the beginning, but um, you know, I was just opening with an opening gambit. You know, is it true that trials are only for new drugs that we don't know much about yet? And I was, and, and I was just wondering, that's a, a perception that many people might have when they first hear about a clinical trial. So I was just wondering if you could answer that question and maybe at the same time explain a little bit about clinical trials and the process of clinical trials, the stages of clinical trials that Emma was touching on. Um, so... Uh... Uh, first, with uh, a very direct uh, answer to to your to you to, to your initial questions, no, clinical trials are not about um, testing new drugs only. Mm, they are, uh, in fact, different types of trials. There are different uh, trial phases. Uh, so the trials are technically divided in phase one, two, three, and some other trials, phase four, that are not normally done, but the most important are from phase one to phase three, where in phase one, if there is a new drug which has a rational to be used against a specific individual, uh, a specific disease, the phase one trial has the very main objective of checking whether that drug is causing harm. So generally it's towards toxicity, seeing whether the drug, the compound that we give to the individual is causing harm. Those are generally a uh, small number trials in individuals who do not have uh, high uh, many opportunities for uh, additional treatments quite often with exceptions i must say 
uh, and the exceptions in the field of chronic lymphocytic leukemia in particular are uh, quite common. Uh, so, but in principle, it is expected that a phase one trial uses a drug of which we don't know the toxicity in an individual in which we are not sure that the conventional treatments are going to work, or we are very skeptical that the conventional treatments are going to work. There is a phase two trial instead in which uh, once we know from the first phase uh, that that drug is not toxic, we will of course go and check whether it is effective if it has some efficacy while the information around toxicity are expanded. Uh, so in those trials, we are gonna see, if you're talking about leukemias or lymphomas, we are gonna see whether the patient is going to feel better clinically, if it is going to feel uh, uh, like the masses or the leukemia is shrinking and reducing and how much. Uh, when we do these studies, which are called phase two, there is not a comparator. And the comparator is essential be because the cohorts that are going to be used are generally still small compared to the human population. And while being still uh, small, they may not necessarily reflect the characteristics of that same tumor in another group of patients. So if the drug is effective, then the third uh, type of trials is a phase three. Uh, the third, uh, phase three trials have the purpose of comparing that drug or that combination of, drug, of new drugs against the standard, the standard treatment, what is expected to be the best treatment for that phase of disease. So there will be an arm uh, called control arm in which individuals receive the standard of care treatment. And there will be a test arm or an investigator arm in which the patient will receive the drug to test, to verify, uh, to compare, uh, and to see whether that works uh, better or as well as the standard treatment, or if that drug works with less toxicity than the standard treatment. Based on the balance between efficacy and toxicity, then it will be said, it will be decided at the end of this trial that generally is large number of patients, enough to reach a statistical uh, significance when differences are noted, uh, it will be then uh, that trial that will allow the clinicians to make a new choice in the future. The point on to whether clinical trials imply novel drugs, uh, that is not necessarily the case for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that um, clinical trials can also be non-interventional. So individuals are asked to participate to studies in which we observe the outcome of um, that form of care. So in CLL, there are quite common observational studies. We run, we run an observational study, for example, here in Southampton, where any patient who has a diagnosis of CLL is asked to uh, provide all their information while uh, uh, we monitor some specific characteristics, uh, molecular characteristics from the lab and see whether they inform the chance of that patient to progress more rapidly or less rapidly, to live longer or uh, a shorter life. Uh, all questions that are basically trying to inform 
the doctor what is the real outcome of those patients. The other is that uh, when we use interventional studies, so drugs, uh, we are talking about uh, either novel drugs, as I was saying, or a combination of drugs that has not been used in combination before. A combination of all drugs that has not been used in combination before. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm talking to a CLL community only here. Yeah, we, unfortunately, because we lost you in the ether, we're, we, we are talking at, to a broad leukemia um, community of audience. So we're looking at acute patients and chronic patients, and therefore mm. what the process means in both cases. Mm. Um, so mean, the, the, the model is the same, but I'll give you an example for uh, a, a practical example for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, in which there are drugs like... Uh, uh, that have been tested in trials as novel drugs. One of these is ibrutinib uh, and another drug called venetoclax. They are all very well known, but their combination is not known. So there is a big rationale in using them together. So uh, how will they work compared to one of the two? if they are the gold standard, or how will they work compared to another type of conventional treatment that does not use any of these drugs? And there are trials, phase three trials, that are looking at these, for example, looking at the combination of known drugs already available in the NHS system against another standard. So that, that's in, grossly um, the concept of what clinical trial means. Thank you, Francesco. I think um, it, it's, it's a very broad subject and I, I'm going to throw the same questions. It's really helpful information to other panelists. I was going to say, uh, throw it over to Emma. I don't know if you've met Emma before because we, 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 we didn't get our introductions together earlier, but Emma's clinical trials manager at University Hospital Wales. Um, I'm just wondering, Emma, if you've got anything to add there when it comes to acute patients and um, optimizing treatments in trials, which can often be the case? Um, I, can you sort of, um, I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. Oh, apologies. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> have you got anything to add from a perspective of um, when you're managing clinical trials and you're caring for acute patients? Any, any observations that you wanted to note? To do with the treatments or to do with the con the actual trial itself? Um, the type of treatments and, 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 and the purpose of the trials often in acute patients? Yeah, so um, I think I think the picture for um, acute patients has um, changed um, quite considerably in, in the last few years that I've been um, working in, in Cardiff. A lot of the times now the trials are looking at certain mutations and certain certain um, developments sort of under the microscope that they can um, tailor the treatment to patients more. Um, and that, that seems to be a very big change now with clinical trials, whereas it always used to be quite generalized across the board that, you know, a patient gets diagnosed with one condition and, and that, that treatment fits, fits all. For, for that condition, whereas now it's very much um, becoming more targeted. Um, the treatments are becoming um, more targeted as well. Um, and obviously we're, we're very much reliant on uh, diagnostic samples to inform our decision making. Um, and that, that really has, has changed dramatically in the last three or four years that I've known of. Um, so obviously the, the way patients get counseled is often very different to how it used to be, um, you know, following a, a more of a generalist approach to actually this could happen if your if your score is this or if your mutation is this. Um, yeah, so lots of changes, I think, in that respect. I hope that answered that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that did. I, th I, I think, you know, from the point of view we've asked is that acute patients going into clinical trials a lot more known is about them from their genomics 
So therefore, it's an opportunity for um, uh, access to to drugs that might be more tailored to suit them. I I picked that up, and what what was quite interesting listening to Francesco was the difference between phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, and that maybe one and phases one and two there might not be a comparator, um, a drug that it's being compared against. It's it's testing toxicity and. Uh, and dosing and phase three is when there's a comparator when it's compared with standard of care or um, there might be more arms with other with 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 other options i guess the question really is jackie um maybe i could ask you what does this mean to patients as a patient are you able to answer um you know i have been in a phase one trial i was actually the eighth person in a first in human trial mm-hmm. um and i've also been in a phase three study so the, the process was quite different I, I felt the with the um phase three trial which was a flare study i was given a lot of documented information and i had a chat with the nurse as well and and it was very very clearly laid out you know what the process would be and 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 um what samples and everything were going to be needed what extra samples were going to be needed and what the treatment was likely to be what the side effects were likely to be um when i was in the phase one study it was it was i spent a lot of time with the consultant um via zoom actually uh, actually going through what the treatment was what they didn't know as much as what they did know I mean, the whole point is that you give fully informed consent and that means that you have to know about the things they don't know as much as the things that they they do know really um so i I was quite anxious going into the phase uh one trial but i couldn't have been better looked after i think probably you are very 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 well monitored and and looked after in a phase uh one study i've spent the first week in hospital um unfortunately it didn't work for me um but i and i was actually the first patient to have uh, severe liver toxicity because of this bispecific T-cell engaging antibody treatment. So although I wasn't able to continue with the treatment, they did learn something new from my experience. Does that help? It does. So that's approaching a phase one trial where there was less known about the yes, drug. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that, as I said, a lot was a lot of time was spent telling me about the things that they didn't know about in other words what sort of toxicities what sort of side effects i was likely to get that that was also made very clear to me that you know it may not work at all i didn't know if it if it would work um whereas i think when you enter a phase three study then efficacy is is at some to some degree is pretty much um insured uh, because the drugs have been so well tested on other patients beforehand so from a patient point of view, um, it's if, if, if there is a suitable option and a recommendation for a phase three trial, that's an easier decision to make than a phase one trial. In many ways, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Which is rather you. reasonable. Sophie, sorry to leave you hanging there. Um, have you got anything to add, you know, from an understanding point of view to help people with understanding the difference trials you know and 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 what uh, what was just explained to you what that meant to you and what that means to you yeah definitely i think my experience with um ucal 2011 was much the same as jackie's experience with flair um with it being a phase three trial it was all um very clearly explained and laid out to me um because i've got a bit of a science background i probably found it easier to understand than someone who didn't um, which is obviously what's so important to raise these things with your, um, you know, your healthcare team, if there's anything that you don't quite understand about what you've been told, um, because it's really important that you do make that fully informed decision on your treatment and your care. Um, yeah, it was all explained really well to me. And it was just, you know, going through the process of this is you'll either get the standard of care or better, essentially, but we don't know. It was like randomised. Um and I was happy with that because not only did I know that I was going to get the treatment that I needed, I also knew that it would be contributing to research for people's treatment in the future. And, you know, without trials, we'd never know what's going to work and what doesn't work. So 
I think, you know, if, if you get the opportunity to take part in a clinical trial and it does sound, you know, that it's right for you, then I'd, I'd take the opportunity again, definitely. Thanks for that, Sophie. So I think that can lead on to one of our uh, myth busters, um, that it's not true in a interventional study, in other words, a study that's looking at new treatments, that you in leukemia, you wouldn't receive a placebo. Am I right, my healthcare professionals on the panel, um, that you would always receive a, uh, effective treatment? In when? In interventional studies in leukemia, um, there wouldn't be a placebo that's non not a treatment. No, hmm. interventional studies, uh, if you're talking about generally, there can be a placebo. Hmm. Uh, okay. The, the phase three, the, the, the clinical trials can be uh, blinded or double blinded. Uh, so, but the no placebo clients. would the placebo always uh, be a, 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 an alternative treatment? It, you would always. So the question, I suppose, is it true that you might not get any treatment in an interventional style? Would would the placebo be water, for example, or would there always be a comparator that's a treatment? Generally, it's sugar, but not not. Um, the, the, it depends. If we are talking about cancer, generally, yes. Okay. Uh, if if we are talking about uh, 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 treatments with. Um, I don't know, uh, neurological psychiatry problems. Quite often, the placebo is the treatment to see whether there, there is, uh, is the, the interventional treatment. So it gives nothing in order to see whether there is a component of the prescription itself on, a, on, on the behavior of an individual. So, it, it, but in general, I think you're very much right that uh, it is, uh, the placebo is given together with, uh, run as a, one of the two arms. Uh, the problem with the placebo is that quite often you are proposed to have a treatment like that, which is double blind. So neither the doctor nor the patient know what the patient is receiving. And there are, a huge amount of ethical uh, issues around studies like these. Uh, it's not been, uh, uh, I think I have participated to a placebo study in which an individual was given either a tablet of sugar and, uh, or was given idelalizib, a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Okay. So that uh, so that, that was some while ago. I mean, in terms of if somebody is up for and requiring treatment for their leukemia and they're offered a clinical trial, um, the placebo wouldn't be would 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 be standard of care unless it was. Uh, I, I think what we're trying to do here is a lot of questions always come that patients are always worried if they join a clinical trial because their leukemia needs treating, they're worried that they might get sugar. Yes. And it's a difficult only... problem. Emma, have you got anything you'd like to add on this? Yeah, so I, I, we work on a, a number of placebo control trials and double blinded trials. Um, and we've got a few in, uh, in leukemia where we would give the placebo alongside the standard of care. So the standard of care would be given and then you would have an additional placebo alongside it to see if that is any better or worse. Um, and at the moment, we so that we would still be given gold standard treatment, regardless of what they're double blind, blinded to. Um, it would just be um, one arm obviously would get the additional drug and one arm wouldn't. And we don't know at that time if that's any better for the patient or not. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's gone through a number of different trials so that if it was um, the interventional, if it was the drug, the drug that the patient was getting, that you know we we're safe and that we know that the patient isn't gonna you know come fall into trouble, you know it's, it's it's gone through a number of regulatory hurdles to get us to that stage. Does that make sense? 
I think so. I'm still <laughs> fish. I'm still fishing because I'm still getting. So, Nick, so there's Nick, a lot I, that people have to understand. Jackie, you you have. So them, can I, the, and just add that if there is a placebo, mm -hmm. and it will be in the patient information, mm -hmm. so it would be clear from the very beginning that at some yeah. at some part of the process there may or may you may or may not be given a placebo alongside your other treatment. Yeah. Your standard so you, care, you yeah. won't be have a placebo sneaked in on you. It won't be done in a, a sort of underhand way. Everything has to be very clearly explained. So as I said earlier, so that you're giving fully informed consent to yeah. the, the process. Thank you, the, other thing to say, the other thing to say with double blinded studies is that um, obviously um, the healthcare provider isn't aware um, the pharmacy isn't aware, not very often we get um, blinded pharmacists to prepare the medication so that they're, they're not aware of what the treatment is. So it's all done very, reg in a, you know, a regulated way so that there is no harm or inconvenience to the patient at all. There is um, probably important to add to that, and um, I apologise for if I've you know but um actually there are break codes so that if the patient becomes seriously unwell for whatever reason then you can there are codes where you can phone I think isn't it Emma yeah. and uh, and find out what treatment that they've had so that if necessary you know a, appropriate other treatment can be given to um, to help the patient so yeah there are ways of breaking the blinded and double blinded uh, trial so that you you know if there's a problem if there's a problem you'll know what they've had. Thank you, Jackie. Um, that's just so we can move on. Um, is it possible to, in lay language, explain again what is a blind trial, what is a double blinded trial, and also what's a randomised trial? What does randomised mean? Any takers? Who do you want to ask? <laughs> so. Uh, the, so what uh, a randomized tri trial is that there are more than one type of treatment options that neither the patient or the doctor decide to choose. So there is treatment A, treatment B, and treatment C, the patient is asked whether they want to participate to a trial using one of these treatments for them. The patient will say yes or no. If they say yes, they will undergo a series of investigations to see whether they are eligible to the trial. And following that, if they are eligible to the trial, then they will be given uh, will be picked uh, for one of the three randomly. Uh, so, so it's essentially a roll of the dice. Um, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a roll of the dice. Yeah. Um, so I would just, a lot of the times, we gather all the information, the eligibility information on the patient to make sure that they're fully eligible and that their health they're healthy and fit to go undergo the treatment. And then we would input those details or certain parts of the details of the patient into an electronic system. Okay. Um, and then the electronic system would randomly allocate the patient's treatment so that we wouldn't have no say over it. The consultant wouldn't have no say. It's a completely fair process for every patient that goes into that trial. Thank you, Emma. That's, that, that's um, really clear. That's helped explain randomized. Um, and I think we're getting the idea with regards to a blind and a double blind. I'm a bit confused between blind and double blind, but essentially um, double blind means that the clinician and the patient doesn't know, but blind means the patient doesn't know. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the clarity on that. I'm going to ask another clarity question because these are other things and maybe patients might be able, the patient, our patients might be able to share on that. What's the difference between an academic study and, and maybe a pharmaceutically sponsored trial? Um, and is there a difference in the experience of patients? Um, maybe I could ask you, Jackie, first as a patient. And, um, 
Well, you can ask me, but I think probably Francesco is the best person to answer. Um, okay. I, have, I have, you know, set up both and I've participated in both. Um, but I think probably Francesco is the best person to uh, to answer that. I'm going to pass over if that's okay. Okay, Francesco, definitely, please. So the uh, academic and non-academic styles is the is the um, um, lay term to talk about uh, commercially supported, uh, pharma supported studies and non pharma supported studies. Uh, commercial trials are funded by a, an industry or a combination of uh, pharma industries, which will provide the drug and the resources to run that study in a hospital. The idea is of the company, which will have done all the preliminary work or collected all pre the preliminary work. Generally, they are the owners of the drug, the, of the drugs that they are going to test in the trial. And uh, the um, only effort that the doctors will do there, there uh, will be to comply with the protocol that's been written by a group of experts, of course, employed or supported or funded by the industry by the commercial partner. Conversely, an investigator-led study is the opposite. There is an idea promoted by a doctor in a hospital, could be me, could be someone else uh, in Southampton, let's say. And with that, I propose to an ethical committee uh, my idea with a protocol written in the same way as it is for a commercial study. And I will be asked to explain the rationale to that study. I will be asked how I would sustain that study. And the study can be sustained through uh, charities, if the charities have supported that study, through uh, companies, pharmaceutical companies, or a mixture of both. And in that, we can open a lot of discussions on what is right and what is wrong, because I'm very biased uh, against commercial, uh, so I make my disclosures, against commercial studies, where, of course, a company will put down millions or trillions of money for a commercial study when they see the financial benefit for that drug to be able to work better than a standard, for example. And of course, the company, unless they have a revolutionary drug, as quite often have been, um, have existed in the last years in CLL, quite often tend to look at differences in survival of mums, which are easy to be skewed. So I'm getting into probably a conversation that we don't want to discuss and that probably is not applicable to uh, leukemias, uh, acute and chronic leukemias in the hematology world. Uh, there are more pertinent situations or impertinent in, uh, in um, epithelial cancers, where tiny differences are looked for from companies. So are you able to explain if there is a difference in experience of patients in terms of regulatory standards and the quality of care? And um... Well, actually, that's something that I would like to learn from you in what is the feeling on what is best uh, for a patient to consider. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I would like to ask you, 
what you think. That was okay. perhaps why I fielded it to you, Jackie. I don't know if you have anything <laughs> to share in that area. I can look at it from two, from two points of view here. Um, so uh, both as a phase three and a phase one study, I was seen in a hospital. Okay, so you're not going to, um, if it's a commercial study, you're not going to the pharmaceutical company's headquarters or anything like that. You're, so you're going to be seen almost certainly by your own doctor. If not your own doctor, then uh, another doctor in another locality nearby, probably, who's running the study. Because the commercial studies tend not to be run in so many hospitals, simply because of the um, massive expense and also the massive um, regulator. I mean, the paperwork that I've seen on these commercial studies is, and the folders and the everything else is, is, is phenomenal. Um, and as a patient, you will probably be subject to much more um, uh, testing and monitoring and visits and everything else than you, than you would otherwise. Um, having said that, you probably also get your expenses paid for and, uh, and things like that. The, the commercial studies are often some of the earlier studies as well. They're not always, the, you know, the phase three studies. They're usually the phase one and phase two where they want to look at the, um, you know, safety, dosing, uh, you know, then they've got, already got some idea of efficacy. And then by then the drug got, often is picked up by um, researchers such as Francesco or somebody else who's got an interest in a particular area and um, a charity will sponsor it and, uh, and it ends up in a huge trial like, you know, like I keep saying flair because that's the one I've got the most experience of. Um, so there, there is, a, I would say, a, a big difference. See, the pre-screening before you enter a trial, if it's a commercial one, is, is very, very different. Um, perhaps quite invasive, you know, in terms of CT scans or biopsies and different things. Um, with a, an academic study that's been run at, at lots of different sites around the country, um, you know, a non-commercial academic study will be um, a lot of that information they will already have as part of your clinical journey so far. So they'll already know whether or not you're going to almost certainly meet the criteria for that study. Uh, so Emma was talking about some of the um, special markers and things. Um, for the ac acute patients, those often have to be done beforehand, although sometimes they're given a, a line of treatment and then it's, um, you know, the trial is adaptive so that they move into a different arm or this, depending on what their markers are. For chronic lymphocytic leukemia, again, my experience is that we already know most of, of those markers and actually they're used in the anal analysis um, to um, drill down to see which sorts of patients have benefited most or, or not from, from that treatment rather than being used so much prospectively. There are a few a few exceptions there but that's generally the case it as in my experience of a, a phase one trial a commercial study was that i was treated on a private wing and i had my own nurses and doctors and this and that and the other which of course is you know extremely different to um to the experience of being in an nhs clinic um and being seen in a in an academic study in an nhs hospital can I just add? To, can I just add to that, Nick? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, so, with um, the commercial studies, obviously, pharma, the pharmaceutical company, come in with quite a lot of money. Um, but also, um, our consultants have a vested interest, and you know, an interest in that in the new drugs coming through. So they look at these studies, um, and we vet them quite closely before we actually say we can go ahead and and, and proceed really? with them. So there's an internal process as well that happens at the hospital that we vet the studies and, and everyone is in agreement that we take that study forward. But then with that commercial study comes a lot of money, comes a lot of, um, everything is very protocol driven. So we get given a protocol that we have to follow very stringently. Um, and after the first patient visit, they would come to site to make sure that everything, that we've done everything correctly and to, to their standards. Um, so there's a lot more monitoring with commercial trials, a lot more um, sort of safety mechanisms, I would say, in place. Obviously, there are with the non-commercial, but everything non-commercial tends to follow standard of care more. So there's no sort of 
no surprises then they can follow we can follow the protocol quite well and and we know what to expect um whereas the commercial trial is very much mandating what we do with the patient it, though though it's very um safety conscious so yeah it, it is, there's a from our perspective as research nurses um there's a lot more um reading and getting really in depth of the protocol to make sure that we're doing everything to get the patient into that study as per the, the policy and procedure. We go through a lot of um, checklists and things to make sure that that patient is eligible for the commercial study. The other thing with a commercial study is that very often we have to send our everything we do with the patient to an outside medical uh, liaison person so that they can um, assess the patient's eligibility as well as the consultant does at site. So there's that an additional layer of um, monitoring with that as well. Thank you, Emma. That's really revealing. Um, so th there's a lot to weigh up and there's a lot of information that patients um, can get access to and need to get access to when they're doing that. I've, Sophie, I realise you've been quiet there for a little while. I don't know if, if, if um, in your own experience with the different types of trial, if you've got anything you want to add? No, again, it was just that um, that phase three UCAL 2011. So it's just interesting to hear um, everyone's perspectives on things. I think with me, even though everything was all explained to me um, perfectly well, obviously I didn't really respond to my trial. So I was just taken off it, but it wasn't, like it wasn't a big deal like I was still getting treatment like it was just like oh, okay it hasn't worked so for that reason we've got to take you off but we can do this instead sort of thing so it was um obviously you you just kept fully informed throughout the process and and people constantly come and check up on you and and assess your side effects and things like that and you know it's it's all contributing to research so it's it's really helpful but yeah just enjoying everyone's discussion <laughs> well, it, um, uh, we've got plenty, plenty to engage everybody. I'm going to, I'm going to throw one at the clinician, um, the clinicians uh, to you, Francesco. So, why might you recommend a trial for me if I was a patient? What, um, when, when do you make a decision? I mean, obviously, you have two heads sometimes as a researcher, and sometimes you have a head as a hematologist. But um, you know, I've got this question that's in the box. When, when would you recommend a trial? Um. As you say, I have two heads, one as a doctor and one as a researcher. Mm -hmm. And I do not, uh, also, however, I do put the two heads together in order not to one conflict with the other. So when, uh, um, I, I think I can only go by examples. The bottom line is that when a patient um, is in a situation to be offered a trial that is available in that trust, in general, the situation is a trial in which the doctor who is uh, participating to that trial believes in, in, the, in the study. So the answer would be that if there is a trial available for a patient, it is meant to exist for the best of the patient. And so in my case, I would always offer the trial, for example. It's already gone through a scrutiny by the doctor who was interested in it. The doctor has brought it up to a protocol review meeting in which everyone criticizes or not the need of the trial or not. Then the trial is brought up to the clinic and uh, there are selection, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. In general, when we get to that stage, it is very likely that there is strong belief in the trial itself to offer it to anyone who is proposedly eligible to the study. Uh, the, uh, there are some situations in which uh, studies are proposed because if they are commercial studies, the hospital may have an advantage 
in gaining one line of treatment for that patient. So more than the rationale of thinking that the treatment is better than the standard of care, there are also uh, social or financial opportunities that will make the treatment more favorable to another, uh, the, 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 the trial more far favorable to the standard of care. In the past, there were trials uh, where type of uh, combinations uh, where treatment A plus B uh, was given uh, against treatment B plus uh, C. And C uh, was another chemotherapeutic agent known to promote toxicity, known to have some efficacy. But at the end, it wasn't a massive game changer in the knowledge of its biology. So there, when you have a scientific mindset, uh, you have also the problem as a doctor to have beliefs so that certain trials you don't want to propose to the patient. And it can happen. Generally, this happens in the, uh, it's infrequent, but it can happen in uh, more easily within commercial studies rather than academic studies. So that we have a bias by the by the industry to use certain drugs as opposed to others. I don't know if I answered the question. Francesca, that, you, that was quite extensive um, and with your two heads as well. Um, Emma, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think it's just important to, to reiterate as, as well that um, we have these internal discussions um, you know, like a joint um, MDT with all our consultants. So we have um, a monthly meeting where we discuss all, all trials coming through, pharma and non-pharma. Um, and we, and at that uh, meeting, there's, a, there's nurses, you know, pharmacists, we all give our opinion on, on the trial and, you know, the, the pros and cons behind it. Obviously the resources is, is a big issue at the minute with the NHS. But you know, if there if there is one um, person who's slightly who's not convinced by the trial, obviously we'll we'll work through those discussions internally. And some some trials, not many, but some trials we do say you know we we do say no to because you know we've we've discussed it as a team and we've moved forward and and chosen what is best for our mm -hmm. patients. So there are a lot of. Um, hurdles to get through, shall we say, which I won't go into this at this call, um, that we have internally to get the trials to the patient, but it's only ones that, you know, that are agreed at the MDT level. That's also extremely helpful that there's the, the, the full care team uh, are involved in the decision making from the clinical side and all information is shared with the patient so that there can be some shared decision-making in the process. That leads us on to a question I really wanted to ask, um, maybe Jackie first. And, um, Sophie, I don't know how much choice you had, but how important are trials when weighing up my treatment options and preferences? Um, I guess that's a broad question, but how important are trials um, when looking at options of standard care, looking at the future? Um, are you able to, look at that Jackie uh, yes sure um oh, gosh I would say the trials are hugely important because um very often and this is something I was going to say about Emma's point as well they're the only way of accessing new treatments and those um new treatments these days tend to be targeted more sort of hopefully more personalized um, treatment. So instead of being um, chemotherapy that, that has quite wide ranging side effects, these, these are targeted treatments that uh, are specific to your disease uh, type. And they're not all available yet on the NHS, although very many are now, um, but it is a, a, a way of, um, of having access to, uh, to new treatments that you wouldn't otherwise benefit from. 
So for me, that was a, that was a massive part. I mean, when I was entered into the randomization in Flair, there were only two arms at that at that point. Uh, one was Ibrutin and Brutuximab, and the other was the standard of care, which was uh, FCR, which was Fludarabin, Cyclophosphamide, and Rituximab. Um, I, having worked in hematology, honestly, I, I wasn't looking looking forward to chemo, so I welcomed the opportunity, and he, and he in fact, um, you know, really spoke up that I wanted to be considered for a trial. Um, no, it's important. It was very important to me to have that opportunity. And it, and to be honest, if I hadn't had the opportunity at the hospital I was at, I, I would have sought an opportunity elsewhere. Thank you for being so candid on that one. And uh, Sophie, if you've got anything you'd like to add there in terms of clinical trial and weighing up your options? Yeah, I think the same, really. Um, if, I, if the hospital hadn't have told me about the trial, then I wouldn't have known about it, especially being you know, recently diagnosed, I didn't really know where to look for anything like that. I didn't know if that was something that I should have been looking at. Um, so to have that option there um, in front of me, it was really nice to think that, you know, that was something that I could choose to do and it would hopefully, you know, be the best treatment option for me. And again, even though I was taken off the trial quite early, um, it was still good to be involved in that and, and to contribute to the research and to have the option to take part. I think it's, you know, it's really good. And if you're thinking about, you know, are there any clinical trials? And there are, are so many different tools where you can search um, for open trials that are going on right now. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of consultants would be more than happy to have a discussion with a patient about a trial and to, you know, talk through whether it would be suitable for them or not. Um, I think something that patients need to understand is that with these trials, there are a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria as well. Um, so again, that's why it's important to have that discussion with your um, consultant to see whether the trial will be suitable for you or not. Can I can I also add, Nick, that um, even though you've you've read the information, you've had a discussion with your doctor, you've had a discussion with the nurse as well, who who's who's your nurse specialist. Even if you sign the paperwork, even if you started treatment, if you have second thoughts, you can withdraw your participation from that clinical trial at any time without it prejudicing, and that's the important thing, that's made very clear, without it prejudicing any of your future treatment or care options. So that, you know, if you come to a point you're really not happy, it's entirely your right to withdraw from that clinical trial process yeah and we we do that as as research nurses as um and obviously you know advocates for the patient we're we're assessing that as well so obviously you know very often when they're seeing their patient when they're seeing their clinician they'll they'll talk about very different things to what they talk to their nurse about so we're we're the ones really that that will gauge gauge that you know when they're out of the room and they finish that discussion um you know in a in a very diplomatic way is everything okay are you happy just to re-emphasize in that with the patient because you know they they like you said they can change their mind at any time they could change their they could be happy with the trial in that consultation and then come up out and and really be unhappy so it, it is constantly gauging that and it's so important to maintain that they are have you know given their informed consent um, at every every time we see the patient it's it's often though with, with some trials Emma you you will will know this that um you've given information and you can go away and talk to your family as well about it it's it, for the acute leukemias it's very often very urgent that some sort of treatment is started and so you might not get days or weeks to to make a decision um but for patients with more chronic um, illnesses then often you know it's one appointment to the next appointment take the information away discuss it with your family even friends or who, whoever you want to so that you can really feel settled in your decision perhaps go back ask some more questions if you need to Think about it a little bit more it, it's really urgent urgent so you know there's plenty of time to um to feel reassured and make sure that it is it is right for you as far as you can at that moment in time 
it's really important. To, sorry, Nick, I was just going to say as well, the, the screening period, which we have to, to make sure that the patient's fit to get into the trial. And then um, we go through a number of tests such as MRI, you know, echo, making sure that they're really robust and, and going to get through the treatment. And that obviously that is a really important part of that procedure, that step as well, before they actually go into the, into the study is the screening, you know, is really gearing the patient up and assessing if they are going to be able to cope um, with, with the trial, you know, so it, it can't be emphasized enough that we are const it's constantly on our radar as research nurses that we're, we're assessing that. That's really helpful. I think that um, your, your um, interjection just now have helped answer some of the questions that have been coming in, um, you know, one being, you know, in, you know, is it true that I can leave a trial at any time? Um, Another question similarly, which you were addressing, is it, is it true that I have to carry on a trial if the treatment stops working? And um, that's what you were touching on there, Emma, um, which was you know, from a point of ongoing management. I've got, so just leaving this section, um, I just wondered just if- it, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if the treatment is working. Yeah. It's not necessarily that, it's just that if at any point, for whatever reason, any reason, you yeah. don't even have to give a reason, for wanting to leave the trial, but you're entitled to leave at any point without even giving a reason. So whether or not it's working, just just so we know. That that's excellent because that I've had the question put to me in two different ways, and you've answered it really clearly. Um, just leaving on that one, you touched earlier on about counselling. Emma did ahead of joining a clinical trial. You know, to what extent would a patient expect to be counselled? And and. You touched also, Jackie, about patient information sheets. So what information is provided uh, and available about a specific, specific trial uh, to patients before they join? And, and how should patients expect to be counselled? Are you asking me, Nick, or Emma? Um, Emma. All three or four of you. <laughs> Both Emma, yeah. Emma, do you want to grab it? Um, yeah, so... Um... So very often, I'm, I'm thinking of um, our, our pathway as research nurses. So we have a number of different documents thrown at us when we've got a new trial and we've got to learn it and we've got to get up to speed and, and look after the patient. And the very first um, point of call as a research nurse, and I always say to my research nurses, is the patient information sheet. So obviously everything in there should be clear, clear to understand for a for any patient. Um, if it isn't, then we as research nurses can go back to the company or go back to the PI and say, this needs clarification. So very often we are at that first po point of call in, in seeing if that information is satisfactory for our patients. Um, but in doing that, we link up very closely with our clinical nurse specialists. So obviously they may have seen the patient without any mention of a trial. Um, so we, we gauge, gauge that straight away and, and find out from them if they probably need additional counselling or an additional information on top of, you know, what we've already given them. So it varies. Some patients will come in and want to know everything and would have researched everything and say, give me this. You know, other, other patients just are happy for you to take complete uh, the complete lead and you know give them minimal information but we've we've got every opportunity sort of scoped out before we actually see the patient to be able to deal with them appropriately that kind of answers that um any patient perspectives um the, the i have to say the patient information if it's these days mm -hmm. read like a scientific paper quite often mm -hmm. and they can be because that, that phrase fully informed consent is so important they can be technical and difficult they literally they can run into 20 perhaps 30 pages long even and so every um all the each drug will be um described and the side effects and this and that and the other the processes whether it's given orally or intravenously there'll be a lot of detail about other sort of investigations that you are likely to undergo either before during and and the follow-up many patients in leukemia trials are, are followed up for life in fact after the uh, after the study has ended 
Uh, it'll go into detail about how frequently you'll be seen, about how, how often you get the treatment, about how frequently you have um, a CT or a bone marrow biopsy or various other different things. All of those things are the sort of things that can make you think, oh, maybe I don't really want to have you know, three or four bone marrow biopsy. But those are the sort of things that, that, that patients think about. And, and because you wouldn't want to get halfway through the trial and then think, hang on a second, this is this is another bone marrow biopsy and I really, you know, don't want to have another one. So all those things, every little bit of the, of the study is laid out in those documents for you to um, to read so that you, you're fully informed. I, um, I've written my own study um, for um, CAR-T patients um, for quality of life study and um, I it was the first time that I'd done research and I took it to the to the rec committee and um, the patient information sheet and consent form was actually they picked up that there was certain things that need to be adjusted very simple simple things that you would that I wouldn't would have missed because I obviously I've never been a patient before I've never gone gone through this before but you know they were picked up to to the point where yeah okay um we need to adjust this so that that reads much clearer it's very often I think that's why there's 17 people on that panel or or, or that many people to all get a different perspective on the patient information sheet I do agree though that they are very long um and they could be shortened but very often if we've if we've got a commercial trial come in and, they, and we've seen the additional patient information sheet we can at an early stage say this needs to be shortened this needs to be taken out this is very unclear um so yeah i think they're always going to be long because you need to cover everything and you look you look at a paracetamol now and you look at the side effect profile and it's it's all there on the paper isn't it you have to give everything um but it's informing the patient at their level what they can digest and how much they can digest at any one time i think and that's why nurses are crucial to that part of the process i think I don't know where Professor has gone. <laughs> um, I think we've lost him. Oh, there he is. <laughs> no, I'm here. I was just, I was listening. I know that my screen uh, bounces up and down a bit. So I don't know. I, I'm yeah. here and I agree very much with what Emma was saying. I, th I think um, I've got a pile of questions and, and one of those that we did touch on that I sort of coming into the zone of um, about extra work that might be involved for patients in clinical trials. And it would appear from comments that have been made earlier, um, some more than others. And, uh, you know, you pointed out the difference between um, commercial trials potentially and investigator-led trials. Um, and a lot of the questions have already been answered and they were kind of touched on, but I've still got a couple left in here. Um, was you know, will you be under a different care team if you join a clinical trial? And will the regular care team be kept informed of, of, uh, of, of a patient's health and trial data? That was one of the questions. I don't know if um, that was touched on, Jackie, you said earlier about having to travel for different trials. Um, is is, is yeah. there any general answers that we can well, get to this? I would only say that if you've got a rarer um, uh, leukemia or something, uh, then you the, the studies won't be open in every centre. And it may be in your best interests, if you're able to, to travel to a centre that has got a clinical trial open. Having said that, of course, you know, you, there, there's very close communication and collaboration between your own team and you would still be followed up by your own team, even though you were being seen by the um, by the research team, you know, for the clinical trial. I'm sure that's right, isn't it, Fra Francesco? No, no. This this say it again. I, what, what was the point that it is? I was saying that uh, if you've got a rarer uh, illness, then you may travel if it was if you felt it was in your best interest to another centre that has got a tri trial open, but there would still be close collaboration between your own team at the local hospital and the team at the trial center. So the problem of traveling is um, 
quite tricky because there are conditions, rare or not, uh, rare, in which you do want to have local care. If the trial is a way to deliver a drug and you're taking care of locally, that's what is required. Otherwise, uh, there is an issue with sustainability and with taking care with, of patients by teams that have not known the patient from the beginning. And I personally do not have an answer to what is realistically best for a patient. The ideal thing is that patients should not travel, as it is quite common that within the variability of the care, the best care is always obtained by staying local. Uh, and I'm talking about it not only for uh, uh, nations like the UK, countries like the UK, but I'm talking about that in general. It quite often happens in wealthy system that people travel to get the last drug available when not necessarily that drug is expected to be as good as the causing a benefit in care as much as it would be if you're treated locally. So it's a very, very dangerous territory. Mm. In relation to uh, rare, rare disease, the system is designed, unfortunately, that uh, there are certain doctors who do subspecialize in very infrequent uh, conditions. Uh, and they become popular to the doctors by uh, positive reputation of colleagues. Uh, again, there it is. Uh, it's 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 a tricky situation as well. And the patient may always argue why not receiving that treatment with an advice from that specialist doctor. Why not having it locally? by the place of care, of my care. There is always a risk that if it happens that the patient wants to travel, it is because the general care system locally is not as effective uh, with and without the trial. So I, I, I am worried always to give uh, an answer. Of course, if it is traveling, if traveling is 10 kilometers uh, from the district hospital to the university hospital, that's a completely different story. But if it is traveling miles or traveling uh, different from different health systems, uh, then we have to put a lot of things in the equation. Thank you, Francesco. That's it, 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 yeah, you know, some expanded considerations when weighing things up. Does anybody else have anything to add in that area? I think again, then is um, going through. Um, in that, that comes back to informed consent, um, making sure that the patient has all the information available to them um, to to weigh up what is best for them. Um, you know, obviously we, we come with families and we come with, uh, you know, a lot of people have difficult um, dynamics at home. Uh, so it's, it's taking that into account with each each individual patient and, um, you know, what, ne what ne necessarily may be best for one might not be in the long run for another. So it's, it's counselling them through that. Very, very sensible. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, to sort of finish off in this area because you've whizzed through so much in everybody's um, information. Um, it's around about uh, the topic of blood samples. Uh, you know, will I be required to give more tissue blood samples during the clinical trial? And what are these used for? Does this require my consent? And on, and on the topic of consent, um, will medical information and privacy be protected? Is... Uh, it's questions about data 
I don't know if anybody's got anything to add in that area about giving tissue samples, um, what they're used for. Um, and I think, uh, sorry, I was going to say that every every um, consent form that that sends anything tissue related should have um, a box on that for on that consent form, which actually talks through the tissue requirements um, and, and where they go in and how they're anonymized. Um, obviously, if there are tissue requirements, which very often there are in haematology trials, um, it would be um, asking the clinician or the, the, the nurses that are with the patient where exactly and what happens to them. Um, we, we deal with a lot of diagnostic samples from all our patients and, and you know, we anonymize them if we need to you know, if we have very strict requirements and, and laboratory manual procedures to follow as to where those samples go. Um, and any any deviation from that is picked up quite early on by the research teams. But any sort of concerns around that, they can ask the care team um, and the research team and the clinician at that early counselling session. Thank you, Emma. That was concise. I'm, I'm mindful of time now, actually. Wow. Um, it, quickly, can I give a shout out for the uh, biobank, which um, is a, a separate um, consent process for any residual samples or even specific samples taken from patients to um, to be stored in the UK biobank, so that um, researchers can get access to um, cells, so that they can they can do research and hopefully improve patient care in the future. That answers the second part of my question. So thank you for that, Jackie. Um, Sorry, that's explained where surplus goes and, and, and how it's used to not, actually- Not necessarily. You do have to consent to it being, um, you know, given to the biobank and stored there. You have to give biobank, consent to your biobank you're talking about? Are you talking about, Jackie? The UK biobank. I th you have a biobank as well, Francesco, yeah? Yes. And the... the that's where I'm talking about triads, and we have to be very weary about what is done of patients' material. Um, Southampton has made their own UK biobank, their own biobank, non-triad biobank, which is funded internationally and not nationally. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, Five million from abroad, <laughs> nothing from inside the UK, which does fund uh, collection of materials which differently from the UK biobank can be used for functional studies and which have been the source of drugs like ibrutinib. So it is out of different model of biobank. It would be interesting if Leukemia Care get acquainted a bit more with this. Southampton has uh, set the basis for the generation of BTK inhibitors and received several prizes because of the biobank that is running in Southampton. And it has no uh, comparison with biobank activities that are run in other centers in which there is only analysis of DNA and that won't help the development of treatments uh, of, like those that have been used. But biobanking is essential. I think that's been ratified by both of yourselves there, and and obviously the consent process is involved in that. So, mm. uh, thanks for explaining that. I'm mindful of time, and I've, I think we're at the information stage. And I've got a provocative. Is it true that leukemia patients have lots of options for trials in the UK? Is that a provocative question? Are there lots of options? And if there are, um, can everybody share some information about where patients can find out about what trials are available? Any thoughts? Any takers? I think there there's so so many trials, um, but they're not all at one stage. Um, so obviously, um, patients go through a number of different um, stages within their journey uh, as a patient and, and within their illness. And that, and there are lots of trials from my point of view as a, as a trials manager coming in at all different um, stages of that process. 
Um, if the patient um, does want to look, they can um, look on Cancer Research UK. Um, there's there's lots of um, channels that they can look, tap into. Clinicaltrials.gov is um, a really good one, and that will go through all phases, and you can do specific searches for your condition. Um, like I said, you know, probably from my point of view, I, I, I always get overwhelmed with the amount of trials that are coming through and I can see that there's just a just a huge number and the appetite is huge. Um, but from a patient perspective, um, go into those channels first. Make sure you go into the, you know, the right channels, clinicaltrials.gov, Cancer Research UK, you know, all of those. And then the helpline with leukemia care. Um, seek some advice before you start looking, I would say, um, and always use the, the, the channels that, that the healthcare professionals recommend to you, otherwise it can be quite overwhelming. Thank you, Emma, that was a really um, informed answer you definitely <laughs> provided. Um, maybe to, to the patients, Jackie, have you got any information sources that you might want to add there, um, uh, uh, Sophie? Uh, I would endorse what Emma has said, but also to say that um, charities can be a vital source of information here. What, whatever you find, you need to discuss with your doctor because they know exactly what would be right for you or not right for you uh, at your particular you know, stage or part of that particular part of your journey. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's about all I'd add, really. Because so, some of the, again, some of the language is very technical and medical, and so it can be very difficult for most patients to navigate. So discuss it with your, with your, with your doctor and the team. Thank you. I, I, I think that just leads on. I've got an interesting one, actually. Whilst, whilst here, I had some interesting questions coming from Facebook. Um, Whose responsibility is it to find a trial? Do the medical team in charge of the, pa uh, the patient find a trial and approach the patient? Or do patients, family search for an available trial and present to the medical team in charge of the patient? Um, so, uh, it is the job of the doctor to be aware. <laughs> I, I've deliberately hesitated waiting for the doctor to speak. Yeah. <laughs> but if the doctor doesn't know, it's very, very important that the family tells them to do their job. So, so it, it, then it depends on the inform, how informed the doctor is. And, and um, so there's a mutual responsibility there. And you would expect a doctor that didn't know um, to welcome any information. And at the time, it's probably an important consideration. Um, you've already, people have already shared, haven't they, um, how important um, weighing up treatment options at, uh, a trial could be for everybody. So thanks for answering that one. Um, I, would, I would add also, though, Nick, if your doctor doesn't know about that trial, then that trial probably is not running in your hospital. Yeah. And if you really want to take part, then you might have to travel. And, that and then that comes back to what Francesco and yeah, you were pointing exactly. out. About the, but, if you, but, but any anything to do with that trial would have to be facilitated by your own team to that to that you know location and then you know obviously a decision could be made but discuss it with your doctor first the one you made me think jackie about traveling uh, the the very uh, successful facilities do put patients in a condition to travel so they are center of reference is local, but the patient travels for specific treatments if the, those cannot be delivered. And I'm talking about big clinical centers, even American centers. So it is the center of care that puts the doctor, in, puts the patient in the condition to receive the very best. And I'm thinking particularly of things like, um the Stella trial for Richter's, where mm -hmm. now, you know, it might be overseen uh, at Oxford perhaps, but actually a lot of the treatment can be delivered locally now. That's been agreed, hasn't it? So yes. you get the best of both worlds, really, as a patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a patient, you, you really want to have someone as close as possible to you who helps you in having the best wherever it is. Isn't that the, yeah. 
yeah the other thing to the other thing to say with that as well is that um we whenever we open a trial in cardiff for instance because we cover the whole majority of wales um is that we circulate that trial if it's a very niche condition and it's a condition that they can't do at every site um we circulate that out to our colleagues when we're just about to have um, green light for the study and we're able to open and start recruiting so that everyone in the network is aware that we have the trial and that it is an option to the patients if if that is a part of the discussion. Thank you for that. I've got time for one last question. Um, there's some really interesting debate here. It just shows just um, how much uh, can be involved when weighing up the decisions in this area. But there is one, we touched on inclusion exclusion criteria, and I just want to answer, uh, end with one question from Facebook, um, from our Facebook listeners, which is um, how well do patients have to be to enter a trial? And I raise that because Jackie just mentioned the Richter's trial and many patients with Richter's might not be too well. So I'm just wondering, is there a, a standard answer to that question? Um, do patients have to be of a certain wellness to be able to join a trial? Did we cover this earlier? That's part of the inclusion exclusion criteria. And um, very often we'll go by a performance status of the okay. patient. So there's a number of criteria listed within that performance status. Um, and, you know, if, they, if they're really low in that performance status, then that they're not going to be we presume they're not going to be robust enough to to get through certain treatments but that obviously is decided on a case by case basis um and you know factored in in the screening process and and the workup of that study and that you would expect the doctor to also have some insight in that before a recommendation for a, a particular trial um, because they would have the knowledge of the post of, of a person's health um, which is, um, I think it's probably a good idea. I've just looked at the clock. I know we started a couple of minutes late. I've got a few slides that I'd like to run through just as we finish things off. But first, I'd just like to thank our great panel. You know, thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Sophie. Um, it's been a really involved conversation and um, we've covered so much ground. And I hope everybody listening in the audience has found it useful. And thank you for joining us on Zoom. Thank you for joining us on Facebook. The webinar will has been videoed and it will be available um, online for revisits. Um, so it, it, I'll just now see if I can share a few slides that might help with signposting to some resources that the charity offers. Um, one thing I will say is if you want to learn a little bit more about clinical trials, the charity websites do actually go into a little bit more depth to help with help, help with your understanding and, and use the different search tools that are available and signposted to on charity websites. So let's just see if I can find these uh, slides. Um, here we go. Um, so uh, a few things from Leukemia Care to give you some insights of what's available and what's coming. Um, please, you know, do visit the website and use our information uh, sources as well. Obviously, webinars, uh, we're in a webinar now, and there's a few coming up that I'll touch on. We have uh, regular newsletters that if you give permissions or uh, preferences for those, you can receive those um, on a virtual monthly basis. And we have our quarterly ma magazine, um, Leukemia Matters, which is a really informed read. Um, podcasts are something that we offer. With, um, Charlotte runs a series of podcasts that cover different topics, sharing patient experience. Um, I have to be honest, I'm not sure if there's one on clinical trials, so I'll have to go through the library, but if there isn't, I'm sure there soon will be. Um, we've got a very active social media, uh, you know, um, and the comms team are providing plenty of information and, and the website. Uh, whoops, I've jumped ahead there. Um, next webinars. Um, 3.30 Wednesday the 13th, um, obviously uh, this is probably more aimed at chronic patients, the uh, CMLs, MPNs um, and, and, and CLL type patients. How do I have a good telephone or video appointment? I think that's because a lot of the care in the community might be in that community, but it's probably applicable to everybody. So that's worth a visit um, if, you, if you've got available time on the 13th. And what can I help when talking to others about diagnosis, my diagnosis? And that's also on the 14th of July. Uh, that's on the 14th of July. 
Um, information's on the website under um, the archive for um, upcoming webinars. Leukemia Matters I've just touched on, and there's our latest uh, uh, celebrity champion who's um, doing a great job for us. Uh, support services. Yep, we have a helpline weekly with clinical nurse specialists available uh, during working hours and the support team. So if there's anything you want information and help, you can also contact us uh, via WhatsApp if you want um, a speedy response. But normally there's somebody on the end of the phone to pick up from the helpline. Virtual support groups. We run a network of virtual support groups. Those are either disease specific or local um, or might be broader hematology groups. Um, those are available on the website. So, you know, if you want to uh, connect with others, that's a, that's a great way to do that. Um, advocacy provide welfare advice and advocacy support can be helpful when it comes to um, work around sourcing clinical trials and helping you with qualifying information about clinical trials. So if you've got any questions in this area and you're unsure and you can't get the information from your clinical team, good idea, contact the charity and speak to advocacy and they might be able to help you with that information sourcing. Online forums, Facebook groups and the buddy scheme, um, these are great ways to connect with other, other patients. Peer support can be one of the most uplifting and, and uh, best ways of helping live with your condition. And obviously those that have gone through experiences before can share information um, on, on how they overcome uh, challenges. And for those that might be struggling emotionally, psychologically, we have a counselling fund um, that offers, um, uh, I think it's six sessions, um, uh, and if, if you apply to the charity for that. Um, I mentioned national support groups or support group meetings. We've got a plethora of national support groups. Um, these are some of the uh, upcoming ones covering some of the conditions, but our national support groups bring together peers in all of the different leukemia conditions. So if you want to find a group in your area, visit the website, it might be something you fancy doing. These are um, at the moment, the majority of virtual, some are in person, um, obviously, we're watching the climate with what's happening with COVID at the moment. Um, I've mentioned advocacy caseworker, please get in touch. And also welfare is it's a troubling time for many people at the moment, trying to sustain, pay bills, etc. cetera. Um, in this climate, the welfare, our welfare office is always there um, with an ear to help you as well. Um, we have our first um, national conference in two years. Obviously, it's been hampered by COVID and still is to some degree. This is a hybrid. So if, 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 if you don't feel able to be able to attend in person because you're immune compromised and you're unsure or you've got too far to travel, it's also available uh, digitally. And this is Saturday, the 13th of August. And there will be talks that will cover um, different leukemia conditions given by the clinicians on latest updates, what's happening in, in treating the diseases. And it's also an opportunity to bring together the family of um, volunteers, fundraisers, the community together, um, everybody in, in the support in support as well as patients and that should be a, you know that should be a fantastic day so that's on a saturday the 13th of august um you know please have a look on the website and if you're interested book your place um fundraising is always something that we're all in need of at the moment everybody is stretched and obviously we do need everybody's help if we can uh, if you can to help us maintain our support um there are many different ways to do that if you have a look on the website there might be something simple that you could do that would make a massive difference um keep up with our latest news our latest news and patient stories as i touched on our social media very active on facebook instagram and twitter and I'll just finish here, um, leaving you the phone number and our support uh, email address so that if you want to get in touch, please do. There's always somebody on the other end of the line there for you. And I'd like to finish again and just thank our audience, and uh, everybody on Zoom for joining us, everybody on Facebook, and special thanks to our terrific panel today. Um, thank you, Emma, Francesco, Sophie, and Jackie. Um, it's been brilliant chatting with you, and I've learned a lot. So goodbye, everybody, and have a lovely evening. Bye, all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.